Welcome to the module looking at the links between physical activity and health, as well as the interaction between physical activity and nutrition. A key message up front, and as noted in previous modules, assessing physical activity well is not that straightforward. Also, given how much nutrition and physical activity interact, it can be hard to tease them apart. But there are a few take-homes right up front. The food you eat provides the raw materials for your body. The food you eat plus your digestive health determines how much of the nutrients are available to you. So think back to the concept of bioavailability, for example. Your physical activity to a large extent determines what your body does with those nutrients, with those raw materials. But what does physical activity do for us in terms of health outcomes and the factors linked to those outcomes? That's what we'll be exploring next. All aspects of physiology and anatomy are affected by physical activity or the lack of it. And as you learned previously, different types of activity have different effects. When I say all aspects, I mean it, including the obvious cardiovascular system, for example, and the muscular system. But also, as mentioned in relation to functions of calcium and vitamin D, the skeletal system, the liver and other parts of the digestive system, the immune system and the nervous system. And that includes the brain. The other systems of the body are also affected to various degrees. Of course, this can also be said for what we eat and drink. The two are never really separate, even though people often study them separately. Over the past decade or so, sedentary behavior has begun to be studied in its own right, and not just as the absence of physical activity. So that is where I'm going to start. Sedentary behavior can be a bit hard to define. Now here's one widely accepted definition. Any waking behavior characterized by an energy expenditure greater than 1.5 metabolic equivalents while in a sitting, reclining, or lying posture. 1.5 metabolic equivalents are not much. That's basically a little bit more than when you're completely at rest. It's important to note that this definition makes it clear that we're talking about waking behaviors. Sleep, as long as it's not excessive, is health promoting and not counted as sedentary behavior. I'd also add that not all sedentary behavior is equal. For example, I wouldn't count sitting or moving in meditation as sedentary in terms of its effects on health. And there is definitely a place for non-sleeping rest and recovery. All of these are examples of sedentary behavior that many people regularly take part in these days. Now let's look at the link to health. The bulk of the current research suggests that as sedentary time goes up, so does cardiometabolic risk. Cardiometabolic risk refers to the risk of cardiovascular disease such as heart attacks and stroke, and the risk of metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes. Those two are very closely linked, and so this concept of cardiometabolic risk has arisen. What specifically are we talking about? Well, some examples include plasma triglyceride concentration. So think back to the lecture modules on lipids, blood glucose concentration. Think back to carbohydrates, insulin sensitivity, also carbohydrates, blood pressure, total cholesterol, waist circumference, and obesity. Some research even suggests that sedentary time may have a stronger influence on waist circumference than the amount of moderate to vigorous activity. And these have all been shown for children and adolescents, adults, all the way through to more senior people. In children and adolescents, there's also an apparent relationship with academic achievement and behavior, basically improving with less sedentary time or getting worse with more sedentary time. That said, the association in children and adolescents between sedentary time and body fat has been questioned on the grounds of inconsistent research results and the limited quality in the assessment of sedentary behavior. So we don't have all the answers yet, but we're getting a pretty clear picture. Sedentary time also affects pregnant women and the developing fetus. Risk of adverse changes in the mother and child go up with increasing sedentary time. For example, systemic inflammation in the mothers. Systemic just simply means general for throughout the body. LDL cholesterol in mothers, so 
a form of fat being carried around in the blood, an abdominal circumference in the babies themselves, as well as more large babies being born to women spending more time sedentary throughout pregnancy. The key message is that sedentary time is independent of physical activity for disease risk. As sedentary time goes up, health and function tend to go down. And by independent, I mean that even in people who exercise regularly, as their sedentary time goes up outside of that specific exercise, their risk still goes up. Sedentary time is its own thing. It's not just the opposite of being active. And it is important to note that the research in this area is far from having all the answers for the topic. So some uncertainty certainly remains. How important is sedentary time versus uh, time spent being active? However, there is sufficient evidence from carefully controlled experimental studies to allow us to conclude that breaking up sedentary time, even if it's only with very light physical activity, is beneficial. And that's true for people who exercise regularly as much as it is for anyone who doesn't exercise routinely. Breaking up that sedentary time is important. And let's think about that another way. Let's say someone exercises for one hour a day regularly. That still leaves 23 hours. What happens in those 23 hours matters. For far too many, modern life looks a bit like this. Get up and eat breakfast. Then a sedentary commute to work or study or wherever they might go next in their day. Now the motorcyclist would at least be getting some physical work in. Then some kind of sedentary work. With a meal or two maybe thrown in throughout the day. A commute home. Maybe a meal there. And then some more sedentary time. Some people might, of course, squeeze in some exercise in that time somewhere. This is very different to what our bodies evolved to cope with. And aside from the metabolic consequences that we've just discussed, there are also going to be postural and movement consequences based on how we spend our time. Our bodies get good at and comfortable with the postures and movement patterns we spend most of our time in. All the time most of us spend sitting can be a big problem, especially for our spines. And they say a picture says a thousand words, so just look at this for a few seconds and note one is representing the morning and one is representing later in the day. If you're a shift worker, you might need to turn that around. But at the start of the day versus some time into it. And depending on what you do, you may have had the problems of sitting, especially of slouching, drilled into you. So maybe you make an effort. But these days we have another problem. Mobile electronic devices. And some have done what is shown here, especially towards the right, text head. Note how the weight that the neck has to contend with drastically goes up as the angle changes. I guess the simple lesson here is try and maintain as upright a posture, whether sitting or standing, irrespective of what you're doing. Move frequently, but certainly if you're going to stay in one posture for a long time, you want it to be more upright. If it's for a short time, move any way you like. Our body is actually designed to change posture all the time. That's its ideal. The key messages here are that sedentary time is independently, so that's of physical activity, linked to disease risk. How you spend that sedentary time influences musculoskeletal health. Here are some ways to reduce sedentary time. So do less of these. Basically sitting or using various conveniences. Do more of these sort of things. I have um, a friend in Australia, also an exercise physiologist. He, for example, will get two baskets in the supermarket instead of a trolley and carry those around just to get in some extra incidental physical activity. We can use active modes of transport. And even if you have a long distance to go, you could go most of the way there and then just do a 10, 15 minute walk the rest of the way, for example. Use the stairs instead of the escalator. Or if the stairs aren't handy, at least walk up the escalator rather than letting it do all the work. Another one I love is standing desks. And as I record this, I'm actually sitting on a recumbent bike. 
The only reason I'm not pedaling is because it would make an annoying noise in the background, but I have been pedaling throughout the day. So the key message really is regularly break up sedentary time with some light physical activity, and then of course, put in your exercise at various points, but break up that sedentary time. It's no good being sedentary for eight hours and then super active for an hour. Well, it's better than not being active at all, but it would be better to have a combination of those. Now let's move to physical activity and also address the question, is it simply about being more active and therefore less sedentary? Or does the fitness achieved from the activity matter? Before we begin to answer that, I want to acknowledge that assessing the link between physical activity and health isn't that straightforward. As noted previously, even though the concept of dose applies to physical activity, there is no simple formula that takes into account all the different aspects of physical activity, for example, frequency, intensity, time, and type. Different types of physical activity have different effects on the body. Just look at the bodies of athletes in very different sports, for example, long distance runners or cross country skiers, weightlifters and powerlifters or sprinters to see the more obvious external differences. Also, measuring physical activity is hard. Questionnaires are subjective and things like accelerometers mostly reflect amount of movement but not the quality of that movement. Compare a long run session with a session of say heavy leg presses and imagine in each case the accelerometer is worn on the wrist as it usually is. For example, if you have a smartwatch, you might have one in there. It's going to pick up very different things. The runner is going to look like they went to great effort, and the person doing the heavy leg presses is basically going to look like they were sitting still at the time. Or you can think about using a heart rate monitor. In the run, the heart's effort is more sustained. The average heart rate is probably going to be a lot higher, and it will be sustained for potentially longer. But with the heavy leg presses, squats, whatever it may be, the heavy activity, that heart is going to have to work extremely hard for short periods of time, much like the other muscles in the body. It can be very hard to compare the two. This means our understanding of the links between physical activity and health are based on using relatively crude measurements of physical activity, or short-term studies looking at the effect of specific physical activity, where at least we can be very confident about the specifics of the activity, but we can only do it for a short time, which means it's very hard to then assume what we observe over those few weeks or maybe months is going to have an effect years and years down the track. And or we're being limited by using measures of fitness instead of physical activity. For example, cardiorespiratory fitness and strength. From an individual and public health perspective, it's important to know what people should aim for. Is it simply being more active? Or is it becoming fitter in one or more ways? Or are both important? When separating the two, one really good indicator is all-cause mortality. And that just means death from all causes. Doesn't matter. Now, of course, death is inevitable. So this really means death over a certain time frame. So a study assessing all-cause mortality would maybe make some measurements at the start and then basically see when people die or if they die over that next period of five years or 10 years or whatever it may be. So we're not suggesting that physical activity or being fit can make you immortal. Obviously not. It's really more looking at whether the fitter people are more likely to survive that period, or the more active people are more likely to survive that period than the less active and less fit people. And yes, studies to date do suggest that although physical activity is associated with all-cause mortality, independent of most other things, it isn't independent of cardiorespiratory fitness. Now the other way around, we can say that the association of cardiorespiratory fitness with all-cause mortality is independent of physical activity. In other words, if you get a group of people who are all equally active, but you also categorize them by how fit they are, the fitter people are better off. But if you simply get a group of people who all have the same fitness, being slightly more or less active overall really doesn't make much of a difference. In other words, we are better off being fitter 
than simply being more active. Now, of course, generally, those who are more active are going to be somewhat fitter. But we can make our exercise and even our other types of physical activity much more targeted, knowing that our goal really is primarily being fitter. Next, probably, is breaking up extended periods of sedentary time. And next is being more active overall. What about if we're just looking at cardiovascular fitness? What are the benefits in terms of health to being fitter in this particular way? The research consistently suggests that being fitter is associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, so death from heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, for example, cancer mortality, as well as risk factors such as body fat, blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, plasma triglycerides. This applies to muscular fitness too, especially absolute strength, which is how most studies have measured muscular fitness. But if you recall, uh, there are other aspects such as strength, endurance, for example, and power. This again applies to all ages in, in varying degrees. The benefits of muscular fitness appear to be partly independent of cardiovascular fitness. So being strong, even though you may not have a great capacity to, to run well or cycle or whatever it might be, is still beneficial. Of course, often the strong will also have a degree of cardiorespiratory fitness greater than someone who maybe uh, doesn't have good strength. And the independence of cardiovascular fitness and muscular fitness in relation to cardiovascular disease mortality specifically is a little bit more uncertain than, than for the other factors. That said, the most protective profile requires possessing both high cardiorespiratory fitness and high muscular fitness, especially in relation to all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. And actually, I would argue it just makes life easier and in a lot of ways more fun. It allows more opportunities for physical expression to have reasonable fitness in both these areas. Now let's look at more specific effects. So where does this relationship come from? What actually happens? Well, yes, we've already acknowledged that the type of activity matters somewhat, but what can we generally expect from physical activity, especially at moderate to high intensities? Well, we see things like muscle fiber type changes. We have muscle fibers that are more suited to aerobic activity and ones more suited to anaerobic activity, so sprinting and strength type activities. Well, if we do more aerobic activity, if we provide more cardiorespiratory challenges in our physical activity, then we're going to favor those fibers and develop those more. If we do more strength, power, strength, endurance training, then we're going to favor those fibers more. Okay, and with strength type training, muscle hypertrophy, which is really saying, making muscle fibers, I should say, bigger. We get increased mitochondria. So these are the part of our cells that really are essential to generating energy aerobically. And what that does is it increases a process called beta oxidation. You can think of that simply as the ability to use fat as fuel, which is very important for health. We also see increased angiogenesis, which is a way of saying new blood vessels forming. And of course, existing blood vessels might very well get bigger. And you can see that in people who exercise regularly, especially if they're quite lean. There can be a noticeable size difference between those people and people who don't exercise regularly in terms of their blood vessels. We also see an improvement in insulin sensitivity. So how responsive the body is to insulin. And we've talked about that previously. And that in turn means that more of the glucose in the blood goes to the muscles, which really helps the liver out. So it doesn't have to do all the hard work. And it keeps our glucose tolerance in a better state. We deal better with glucose as a result of regular physical activity and the changes it drives. We get increased glycogen storage. Right? Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. 
our muscles take up more glucose and store that, which helps us the next time we need to use them because they have a nice ready to supply of energy already there. On the bone side of things, which has been mentioned before, we have something called Wolf's Law. In other words, tension and compression on the, of the bone increase bone deposition. So for example, calcium and other mineral deposition into the bone. And that increases bone density. It can also increase bone size. Simply means that physical activity, especially weight bearing physical activity, helps us have stronger bones or maintain stronger bones. What about some of the other systems, some of the other organs? Well, the increase in angiogenesis, that is the formation of new blood vessels, doesn't just affect the skeletal muscle, it affects the heart as well. And erythropoiesis, which is the name for the formation of red blood cells, is also enhanced because more red blood cells mean more oxygen around the body. That means we can use more energy faster, more oxygen, more energy at any given point in time can be used because to generate that energy, we need the oxygen. If there's not enough oxygen, not much else happens. We can get heart hypertrophy. In other words, the heart gets somewhat bigger. Really, mostly, it gets thicker walls. If you work a muscle, it gets bigger. The heart is no exception. That increases stroke volume. So that's how much the heart can pump in one contraction. And it decreases resting heart rate partly because it increases stroke volume and partly because it makes our bodies overall more efficient. It decreases high blood pressure. So it's not going to decrease our blood pressure if it's normal and healthy, but if we have high blood pressure, exercise will tend to decrease it in the long run. While exercising, our blood pressure goes up, but that's a normal, desirable response within reason. But afterwards, blood pressure will go down more into the range of the desirable norm. And we get a decrease in circulating lipids. So remember, lipids are fats and oils. So less fat in the blood, basically, and a decrease in inflammation. Not necessarily immediately after a hard workout, but in the long run. Now, in the liver, we get increased glycogenolysis. In other words, we get an increased breakdown of the stored glycogen so that the resulting glucose can end up in the bloodstream and supply the muscle. Again, it means the liver doesn't really have to hold on to that and deal with it. Because if you recall, the liver having too much glucose, more than it can comfortably store, results in it actually turning some of that glucose, not into glycogen, but into fat through the process of de novo lipogenesis, which we have covered previously. And generally, we don't want that. So this is a good thing. It can increase gluconeogenesis. So gluco, glucose, neo, new, genesis, making of. Making of new glucose. So if there really isn't enough carbohydrate already in the system, then the liver can make more if it's needed. And it drives down this de novo, diva of, novo again, new, lipogenesis, making of lipid. So we get a decrease in this which means it's less likely we'll end up with excess fat in the liver, and for that matter, in the body and other organs. And it increases the liver's sensitivity to insulin. Again, it helps it be responsive. Also, getting regular movement, it doesn't have to be intense movement, but getting regular movement, especially throughout the upper body, the torso especially, is going to help with digestion. It's going to help move things along and keep our bowels healthy much better than just sitting still all day and forcing basically the intestines to do all the work on their own. It's another way of looking at this. We're talking about the acute. So acute, basically, I'm talking about what happens while we're moving, while we're being active. The acute metabolic effects of exercise. The muscle contraction leads to blood glucose going into the muscle, leads to fat from the adipose tissue going into the muscle to fuel movement. So we get increased breakdown of fat. We get increased glucose in the muscle. We get, after the exercise especially, increased storage of glucose in the muscle as glycogen. We get increased release of glucose from the liver. We get a decrease of fat synthesis in the liver. And we get a shift in the hormone production we get a decrease in insulin from the pancreas and an increase in glucagon from the pancreas. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this paper, though.
if those are the acute effects, the short-term effects, what are some of the longer-term effects of exercise? Well, a more lasting effect is hypertrophy. That's, that's um, increased muscle size. And that increases our resting metabolic rate, although only very slightly. And that may help with weight maintenance. But having a bigger, stronger muscle lets us do more work in less time while we're physically active. And that's really where the benefit comes from in terms of consuming extra energy. Now think about it. It's going to take a body more calories to pick up 200 kilograms off the ground than it is 100 kilograms off the ground. But you're going to need somewhat more muscle to lift the 200 kilograms. So a degree of hypertrophy is certainly desirable in terms of energy balance. We do over time get increased efficiency. So if you're always doing the same kind of activities and movements, your body is smart and it's going to get more efficient. And as it gets more efficient, you use less energy for the same activity at the same intensity. Now, you can of course fix this if you want to be inefficient, if you want to use a lot of e extra energy by changing up what activity you do. But if you're uh, practicing for a sport, for example, you want to be efficient. You don't want to be wasting energy for no good reason. It just depends on the goals. You get the increased mitochondria. This is where the fat gets used. And this is where carbohydrate gets used in an efficient way as well. So that enhances our ability to use fat. And there is even some research that resistance or strength type training in the mid-teens actually leads to a permanent shift in muscle fiber type that you don't get nearly to the same extent later on. You get hypertrophy, you get these other shifts, but there's limited capacity to change that fiber type. It gets a bit complicated and it's really beyond the scope of just physical activity and health. It's just a little bit of an added bonus. A lot of people are interested for themselves and from a public health perspective in physical activity and the effect on body composition, not just cardiometabolic risk. So, being active right now, just on its own, is not going to be a change in body weight. There's not going to be a change in visceral fat. Remember, that's the fat around the organs. And there's not going to be a change in fitness if you do it just once. But there's still immediately a reduction in global cardiometabolic risk. Now, that reduction isn't going to last. But right now, if I'm being active, my risk is going down. Chronic or regular activity, even without weight loss, right? weight on the scale stays the same, it's going to change body composition. Visceral fat goes down, fitness goes up. Predominantly the type of fitness that we're training, but probably a little bit of all the kinds of fitnesses if we're moving well. And a, there's an even bigger reduction of global cardiometabolic risk. Now, if we go the extra step, which, which may mean doing a lot of physical activity or more likely pairing physical activity with some dietary changes, if we're doing physical activity with weight loss, then while well, we see a change in body weight, a change in body composition, visceral fat goes down, but so does subcutaneous fat, so the fat under the skin, fitness goes up, and there's a big reduction in global cardiometabolic risk. So that's, that's ultimately the goal for anyone with a lot of excessive body fat is to regularly do physical activity, regularly be active, regularly break up sedentary time and alter their diet to support a change in body composition as well. Key messages, most positive effects of physical activity decrease over time in minutes to weeks. So it's important to be active regularly and throughout life. And I've mentioned this before in relation to especially glucose tolerance how well the body deals with glucose, how it deals with glucose. My physical activity now, especially if it's quite light, is mostly going to benefit me in the moment. And the more intense that activity is, the longer that effect lasts. But really on the outside, we're looking at last, it lasting three to four days in terms of metabolism. Now, if, if I'm basically doing exercise that will get my body to lay down muscle, develop strength, that's going to last quite a bit longer. The rule of thumb is really that with aerobic activity, it's a little bit quickly come, quickly go. And you can, you can discover this for yourself if you haven't previously. Let's say the first time you go for a cycle or a run or a swim, if it's been a while, it's pretty hard. 
Then you go the next day. It, it might still be a bit hard, but go go regularly for a few days and you'll be quite surprised at how fast you improve. Eventually you, you, you reach a plateau. But at first you improve pretty quickly, but then something happens. You just get busy. Let's assume you don't get sick. You just get really busy and uh, you maintain your diet and you maintain sleep, but you just don't have that time to exercise. And you come back to it a week from now or in a few weeks time. And chances are quite a bit of that fitness will have been lost. It depends a little bit on how long you had it, how many fundamental changes in your body occurred. But if, you've, if it was recently that you've developed that fitness, it can go pretty quickly. That's less true for strength type fitness. There, it's entirely possible if you're working fairly consistently for say a few months, building your strength, you might even find that a layoff of one or two or even three weeks, you might come back where you were or even slightly stronger. You might have needed that extra recovery time. Again, I'm assuming your layoff wasn't because you were sick or extremely stressed and I'm assuming you're still eating the way you were eating before. So nothing else is getting in the way. So the, those two areas of fitness are somewhat different. But in terms of health, recognize that fitness, uh, physical activity and health, it's an ongoing process. If you stop, a lot of the benefits stop soon afterwards. And if you go again, they'll come back pretty quickly. And it's not just what we might think of as physical. There are definitely benefits for the brain and the nervous system. A research reports things like improved memory with more physical activity, uh, improved concentration, improved sleep quality, improved resilience to the stresses of life, uh, improved mood and decreased depressive symptoms, decreased perceptions of distress, which includes anxiety. And physical activity has this direct effect on the nervous system because the nervous system is the first system to respond to change in physical activity, to respond to changes in the intensities. Higher intensities push us more toward the fight-flight state, and quite low intensity activity can actually help us to move more into the rest, digest, heal, and learn state. Both have their place and they need to be balanced. So lower intensity and low intensity activity is a great way of breaking up sedentary time. We should certainly be spending quite a bit of time in that lower intensity activity because it can really help improve calm. And spending a little bit of our time doing more intense things. Far too many people these days base their physical activity, especially their exercise, around exclusively high intensity stuff. And they forget that there is a psychological, a nervous system benefit, a recovery benefit to the lower intensity activities. Key message here being that different intensities have a different effect on the nervous system. Just a bonus tip. If you can, whenever you can, be active in nature. There seems to just be a general health boosting benefit, mood boosting benefit of getting out into nature, even if it's not quite this beautiful a scenery. And you can do that walking outside, cycling outside, uh, going swimming outside, if you can tolerate the cold or at least in the, in the warmer months. But hey, you can take your exercise equipment outside, you can swing a kettlebell outside, you can throw a heavy ball around outside, you can go to the beach like I have done in the past, and just see what logs are there and you can do some squats or lifts or whatever and balance as well at the same time, shift sand around, whatever it might be. Do some of that activity outside. The benefits is things like you get more vitamin D production. You also get more production of something called nitric oxide in the skin, which actually helps with exercise and it appears to be part of muscular growth and it's certainly mood boosting and stress reducing. Lastly, let's just have a look at the New Zealand activity statements, specifically physical activity statements. So what are they? What is the advice the New Zealand government has for us? You'll see it's fairly consistent with what we just covered. So it's things like sit less and move more, break up those long periods of sitting or long periods of sedentary time, whatever posture you're in. Do at least two and a half hours of moderate or one and a quarter hours of vigorous physical activity spread throughout the week. Now they haven't been very scientific about how they've defined that. You know, they haven't said intensity so much, they've just said moderate 
and vigorous. Now, what is that? But what you can see is that in many ways we regard vigorous activity to be worth more per unit time than, than moderate activity. And then there's also low intensity activity, and I don't mention that, but as I've said, that's really what you would be breaking up that sedentary time with. Now you're going to get extra benefits if you do more. It is possible to do too much, but it's actually quite hard if we're talking more moderate activity. It's easier to overdo super intense stuff. The aim here is five hours of moderate or two and a half hours of vigorous spread throughout the week. Again, the activity effects, the benefits aren't going to last that long. Ideally, you want to be doing something every day or most days, not just be super active on the weekend, although that's certainly better than not being active at all. Also, do some muscle strengthening activities on at least two days of the week. As we saw, that is independently of all the cardiovascular stuff linked to reduced disease risk. And also to recovery from injury or recovery from disease. Even if someone is unfortunate enough to say, have an encounter with a heart attack or, or get cancer, at least some types of cancer, if they go into it being fitter and stronger, they're much more likely to come out of it in better shape and deal with it going in. And of course that last statement, you know, wherever you are, the goals don't need to be lofty. For most of us, the goal is to be doing a little bit more than we are right now. And if we're hardly doing anything, that's very low hanging fruit. How do physical activity and nutrition interact? I'm covering this especially in the context of your assessment and learning outcome too. Diet can support or undermine physical activity. Now, aside from dealing with fat and glucose better when we're more active, we've got other things. All the calcium and vitamin D in the world isn't going to make strong bones unless those bones are stressed to be strong. All the protein in the world isn't going to build bigger, stronger muscles unless those muscles are stressed. That said, we can be doing some pretty intense training if we're not consuming enough protein, for example, uh, then we're going to undermine our results. If we have a micronutrient deficiency, we're going to undermine our results. And in fact, the more active we are, the more of certain micronutrients we need, especially, for example, some of the B vitamins that are so central in energy metabolism. So we want, and we should be promoting to others if we're in the health promotion field, the importance of appropriately combining physical activity and nutrition. Although, for any given person, we might need to start with one or the other until they're ready to hear about whichever one they're not really interested in changing. So some people say, hey, make me exercise. I'll do that, but don't tell me not to eat fish and chips. Or they might go, look, you're never going to get me to exercise, but I am prepared to change my diet. If you can get that person to move a little bit along their journey, doesn't matter which person we're talking about, chances are they'll become more open to changing the thing they weren't originally prepared to change. Start where people are at. The other point, and I've basically mentioned this, is physical activity creates the physiological environment what we eat interacts with, right? So it changes our bodies and how our bodies respond to the food we eat. A healthy diet, whatever that might be for any given individual, is only going to get them part of the way to better health. Physical activity is every bit a part of that. And the reverse is also true. And yes, there are elite level athletes out there with really poor diets. Few, fewer and fewer, but there are, okay? I guarantee that youth and genetics and sheer work ethic is helping them out now, but it won't last forever. 